how long the body is past the um, actual um, um, chest cavity. And then the um, uh, there's a lot of vibrissi. So vibrissi would be whiskers. Um, you may be able to see that in that picture. I'll, I'll show you a close up in just a second. It's amazing how many whiskers river otters have. And of course, they're highly innervated. So that allows them to to basically detect prey in water, especially muddy water where visibility may be really poor. Um, so it can be really as far, and also in terms of just navigating in a very um, uh, difficult environment. Uh, I have the largest weasel in Ohio with a question mark because that may change and, and badgers are right up there along with them. So most of the otters that we have handled so far, the adults are somewhere between 10 to 15 pounds, but they can get up to 20, 22 pounds. Uh, some of the big adults, some of the males, there is a sexual dimorphism. So males are um, about five to 8% larger than females. And that's again, typical of the weasel family. Um, all weasel species have a strong sexual dimorphism. Here's a picture of one of our radio tagged um, otters uh, that the photographer is able to get fairly close to. It kind of illustrates the whiskers on this animal, just how many there are and how long they are. So it's a really important feature of theirs, again, for life and, and water. They're, they are super predators, so they are extremely carnivorous. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't take some other foods, but mainly they're meat eaters. Um, and so they are um, highly predaceous and they're extremely effective predators. So um, they are really good at capturing crustaceans, um, fish, amphibians, and um, they will deplete a pond or a stream in a short period of time if there's no other place for them to go. Um, a couple of other just basic facts that uh, make them fairly unique uh, compared to some of the other mammals that we deal with. So among the, the weasels, I would say that river otters are probably the most social of any of them. The general trend for weasels, a whole weasel family, the mustelidae, is to basically be antisocial. So basically, weasels are kind of mad at the world. Um, that helps them be a, a really aggressive and an and, and extremely successful predator. Uh, but it doesn't do very well for um, social relationships. So most weasels are solitary, and they like it that way. But uh, river otters, um, there's still a lot that we don't know about their social system, but we do know that they will form associations with each other. In some cases, it may be the mother and the offspring, such as in this picture. Uh, but in other cases, it can be unrelated females can also socialize with each other. That's happened. And definitely adult males sometimes will form associations with each other uh, for traveling and, and hunting. So it's not uncommon to see otters either alone or with another otter or in sometimes a group of otters. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Um, they are typical of all the other weasels in that they are polygynous, which in actually more promiscuous, which means that they don't uh, form um, exclusive bonds, mating bonds. So they will mate with multiple partners. I have mating season with a question mark there because that's another kind of a mysterious aspect of river otter behavior and ecology. Um, their whole reproductive system is um, complicated and it makes it difficult for us to kind of um, stereotype them or pigeonhole them into a certain calendar uh, system that we have. So it goes something like this. Their mating probably occurs most of the time in late spring or summer after the female has, has weaned or young. Um, one reason why it's kind of um, mysterious a little bit is that um, they have delayed implantation. So the female, when she's fertilized, um, will the, the, the eggs, the fertilized eggs will undergo a series of division to a point 
that before they're implanted in the uterine wall, they will um, go into a delay and they will basically float in the uterus and uh, they won't implant until eight months later. But that eight months, it may not, it's probably not going to be exactly eight months and it may de depend or differ a little bit based on on the female's condition, based on weather conditions, based on factors that we don't really understand. So that makes it hard for us to backdate in terms of where did mating actually occur for a lot of these animals. But we do know that they go through this long delayed implantation. Um, and then when we get to the normal mating period for a lot of the terrestrial um, carnivores, um, such as raccoons and and um, coyotes and bobcats and things like that. Typically it's it's February or a little bit of January and March. That's also when otters implant. Um, they may do it a little bit early. So we have actually had embryos in February. So that means that they implanted in January, but they typically implant about there. And then they have a typical gestation period of about 62 days, which is very similar to a dog or a coyote or a raccoon or that type of thing. So the same sized animal has the same length of gestation period. It's just they go through this delayed implantation. The overall um, impact of this is that females basically are pregnant about 10 months of the year. Um, it's just that most of the pregnancy is just simply these little blastocysts, little tiny um, balls that are um, floating in their, in their uterus. So, um, that's, uh, again, most weasels, not all, but most of them have uh, this delayed implantation. Um, and so do uh, other groups such as bears. Um, as we mentioned, they are um, aquatic, but they do spend a lot of time on land as well. One of the things that they do on land is that they um, form latrines. So they do mark their areas and why they do this, we don't really understand, but what an otter will do, this is a latrine on the ground, um, actually we teased it apart to look at the diet items. Um, what they'll do is they'll actually pull up the grass and, and the vegetation into a mound and then they'll defecate on that mound. So they really want their, their poop to be observed. Um, so they're they're not shy about it at all, and it's out there, obviously for a reason. But we don't always completely understand why that could occur. So a lot of other species of latrine um, um, are territorial, and it's often a territorial marking. In the case of otters, they're not really territorial, so we're not. It could be a family bonding thing. We're not not really sure. But that's one sign that you can use to determine whether or not you have otters say living in your farm pond or um, a stream or that type of thing is to look along the dikes, look along the, the banks, and you're looking for a mound with um, this uh, poop that actually looks kind of um, uh, globular, moist, it's very moist, and there's a gelatin type of texture to it with a lot of fish scales and bones. If you have a lot of fish scales and bones in there, then it's Probably not a raccoon poop, it's a otter poop. And um, that's one of the signs that you use. All right, so that's a little bit of natural history. Um, a little of the story of otters is uh, pretty fascinating, um, both in terms of North America as well as Ohio. Uh, here's a couple of maps I pulled off of um, their, um, there's a, recovery plan for river otters and this is in that plan and um, they're not the best productions of maps but it does get the point across which is historically otters were found almost continuously across North America. Basically if you had wetlands you had otters to some degree. Uh, so they were very common all the way from the northern reaches of Canada and Alaska all the way down to the, the Rio Grande. Um, and then of course, uh, European expansion and trapping, um, the, the, tra the fur trapping market basically caused a huge decrease in their numbers and depopulation or extirpation from large parts of, of the US. 
especially um, some of the eastern and midwestern states, um, including Ohio. So Ohio had otters, of course, historically, but then by the late 1800s, um, otters had been greatly reduced or extirpated altogether. The map to the right is the uh, uh, one um, current, it's a semi-current map of the distribution of otters. And so if you consider that they're basically were extirpated for most of the eastern and midwestern parts of the US, there's been a pretty good recovery of their numbers. And that recovery has been a little bit of a natural recovery. Um, just the, the expansion of the, the resident populations that were left, such as in, in Michigan and New York and in some other places. But it's largely due to an active reintroduction program. Um, it's one of the most successful reintroduction programs in North America for any species, but especially for, for mammalian species. Um, this started back in 1976 in Colorado. Um, and then the last state to actually engage in reintroduction was New Mexico about 10 or so years ago. Um, so roughly about 4,000 otters were captured mostly in Louisiana. So they came, came from a fairly restricted area, not all of them, but a, a majority of them were coming from Louisiana and then transplanted to these other states such as Ohio and then released. And um, it's interesting, I like to point this out, is that the fur, um, fur trappers or trapping, the, the use of uh, steel um, foothold traps um, was the reason for the extirpation of otters, um, ca the cause of uh, their, their disappearance. But it's also been incredibly important in terms of the reintroduction and the recovery of the species. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible without using the same traps they use for fur trapping, but to use them for live trapping and then transporting them to these other states. And so luckily, otters, um, once they're released into an area, if they're healthy, uh, do extremely well. Um, and they have a very high survival rate in general, just naturally. And um, that allows them to recover, which is the story of the otter in Ohio. So um, the reintroduction program in Ohio um, involved basically 123 river otters, um, roughly not quite half, uh, slightly fewer females than males. When possible, the females were pregnant uh, when they were reintroduced. Um, this occurred between 1986 and 1993. And they were released in four locations over in the eastern part of the state. Those are those dark areas that you see there. So those are the release points in four different watersheds. The population then was monitored for a number of years by the Division of Wildlife and, and uh, their partners, and usually through things such as bridge sign surveys. The gray areas represent um, counties or watersheds where um, otters have been detected. Um, so um, that's a little bit out of date. Um, I think that we're at the point now where almost all 88, 88 counties have um, some sign of river otters. River otters obviously are more common in, in parts of the state than in others, especially the eastern part. Um, but it's not uncommon now to have otters in most water bodies across the state. So because of that success, um, the division initiated um, a very restricted harvest. It was kind of an experimental thing in 2005. Um, that was one of my early graduate students, uh, Paul Flournoy, uh, was working on that part of it. So. Um, they uh, required trappers to turn in their carcasses to us to allow us to get some information from those animals so we could get a population profile and to determine uh, what would be a, a, a safe level of, of harvest that would not impact or negatively impact the recovery of the, of the animal. 
So ever since then, they've been uh, requiring trappers to check in um, carcasses when possible for, uh, for monitoring the population. Um, and I'll talk about that harvest in a little bit more detail because that is a large story in terms of their status. So when they initiated that harvest, they had the state split up into three zones. Um, and these red boundaries represent uh, those different zones, A, B, and C. Uh, the zone C allowed trappers to, uh, first of all, they could only trap during a, a narrow window of time, basically during Jan um, uh, mo mostly January and early February. Um, they could only take a maximum of three animals in zone C. Zone B, they could only take a maximum of one animal. And then zone A was, uh, the animals were still protected and no trapping was allowed. These um, numbers that you see in these counties represents the average number of animals harvested each year over um, basically a, um, let me see, almost about a 15 year period. Um, so again, um, that was how they maintained the, the trapping from 2005 through um, 2017. Um, it became apparent that the population was still um, expanding, it seemed to be still doing well. Our, our modeling effort in terms of the population size indicated that um, the number of animals being trapped was very small compared to the overall population size. So they made a switch in the 2018-2019 period uh, where basically they, um, they changed the parameter of zone C. So they took a few counties out of zone C and moved them into a zone B. And then they basically um, moved all of the zone A counties into a zone B. So now currently in terms of trapping, there's only two zones, um, zone C that still is capped at no more than three animals per trapper, and then B, um, no more than one animal per trapper. Those numbers that you see in those counties represent the number of animals trapped during the first year that they did that. And you can see that uh, the numbers are actually quite small in general. So these are total numbers of, of otters harvested for those counties. And um, in general, they're, they're in single digits. So it's a very low harvest rate on these animals. And um, that's at least partly due to the reduction in demand for North American fur. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of social changes and um, a lot of countries now outlaw um, wild fur altogether. Um, and so that's decreasing the pelt values and reducing the demand for, for trapping. And so, um, so you don't see a lot of animals um, getting trapped as much now. So that's the current status of, of otters, still very restricted um, and um, very limited number of, of take. You see, and these are the actual harvest numbers for Ohio during those years. And the biggest, Harvest take was in uh, the very first year in 2005. That was a huge year. And uh, we were wondering whether or not, you know, that was the very first year of any type of harvest in over a hundred years for Ohio. And so the question was like, what is going to happen? Like how many animals are gonna be taken? But you can see it quickly dropped down. And then since then it's fluctuated somewhat basically between a hundred and 200 animals each year. Um, our modeling effort, um, there's a lot, there's a wide range in terms of our population estimates for Ohio, but they tend to revolve roughly around um, five to 7,000 animals possibly in the state. Um, I think it's probably five or maybe a little bit lower. Um, so if you consider, if you just a rough number of 5,000 animals, if you're taking a hundred in terms of harvest, it's a fairly low, fairly low take. Um, but the one thing that is interesting is that most of the harvest, and this is partly due to the the difference in um, 
uh, the limit. So again, they can take more otters in the northeastern part, but still, when you look at where are otters harvested, and this is our map that we generated, the grad student and I, from the actual locations where trappers took otters, you can see that basically the four uh, reintroduction areas are still the areas where most otters are, are trapped. So um, it's a fairly interesting thing, but that has not changed over the years whatsoever. So most of the, the population probably in Ohio is still being generated from um, those original points. So what did we get from that? So what, what did we learn about the Ohio population? Uh, from those early years, we learned that um, the age distribution is skewed toward younger animals. And so one of the things that we do um, with, the, with the otters, the carcasses, um, after they're turned in at a check station as we extract a tooth and then we can age the animal down to the year um, based on uh, what we call cement manuli in that tooth. And so that gives us the age distribution and the age distribution is really important for us to determine whether a population is growing or whether a population is probably stationary or if it's declining. So if it's growing, it would be skewed more toward the younger age classes and that's what we see here. So uh, age is over on the left hand side and then this is broken out between males and females. There was no difference actually between males and females in terms of age structure. Basically most of the population are animals um, two and a half to um, six months of age. So um, that's that's generally what you see in this case, this is from the earlier um, trapping effort back in 2005 and 08. And during that period, the oldest animals were um, a little over 10 years of age. More recently, uh, we did the same kind of analysis with a smaller sample size, but same kind of pattern emerged. So this would be from um, right before um, the COVID outbreak. So the last trapping period before that. And um, again, animals that are um, two years, between two and three years of age and younger dominate the population. Um, the median age of a river otter in Ohio is 1.6 years. That's what that means. The oldest so far of the record is a 12 year old and that was a female. And um, she actually had a, uh, was going to have a litter of five young, which is the max that these animals can, can do. So pretty impressive animal. Um, and then I don't uh, ignore the graph on top. This is from um, a report that we did. Uh, the graph on the bottom shows you what the litter size is. Um, for these animals. And this is important for us to understand kind of what the reproductive rate is like for the for the population. But this is how many young a female would produce. And so, um, and this is, so the, the number of litters that would be the, 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 basically the number of females producing a litter size of, of either two, three, um, uh, uh, yeah, two, three, four, five, and six. And so um, you can see that a litter size of three is the most common. The next most common would be four and then two. Um, we do have a, a six there. I'm not um, sure that that was a viable um, number, but five, we've actually had a number of fe uh, females that we're going to produce litters of five now. So that's a pretty large litter size for an otter. Um, so the other thing that we can get from um, these uh, animals that are turned in by trappers is that uh, we can look at their diets. And so this is a major question about these um, alpha predators in these aquatic systems, like what are they eating? And um, there's a lot of concern from some user groups, especially fishermen, are concerned about uh, whether or not they're going to compete with them for their sport fish, or um, in some cases, you may have areas with um, um, some endangered or, or threatened um, mussels or clams. And so um, otters have the capability of impacting those. Um, so I was a, when I was a early graduate student 
at the University of Missouri, uh, Missouri had one of the most successful auto reintroduction programs that became too, su too successful and the otter population took off. They did not initiate any type of a harvest or any kind of limit. And basically they have a very active aquaculture program um, or industry, I should say, in Missouri. And the otters were definitely impacting the aquaculture um, industry. So you can imagine what it's like for an otter to find its way to an aquaculture facility <clears throat> where you have these nice, clear, unobstructed ponds with big fat fish in them. So, um they learned the value of um of um trying to manage the population a little bit but the main thing was in diet you know how much was there really a conflict or how much a, of it is a perceived conflict <clears throat> so what we did is we used a a, a a process called stable isotopes analysis we've we've used a similar approach for um looking at the diet of coyotes and a couple of other animals. Um, and so this involves taking, um, in this case, it was a muscle tissue from um, each harvested otter and um, analyzing it for carbon and nitrogen isotopes. And these are signatures that reflect um, the diet that the animal was consuming or the food items the animal was consuming while, and then depositing that in the production of their muscle tissue or hair or bone or that type of thing. Um, and so what you can do if, if their diet items also differ in terms of their carbon and nitrogen isotopes, you can actually estimate how much of those particular diet items were in the diet of that animal when it produced that, that tissue. In this case, it would be muscle. So I'll illustrate this in just a second. What you're looking at here is a diagram. This is a, what we call an isotope map with carbon along the x-axis and nitrogen along the y-axis. And each one of those dots represents an individual otter from Ohio um, that was harvested and we, we analyze it. And there's a couple of things that we're looking for here. We're looking at whether or not males and females have the same kind of uh, pattern in terms of diet, which in this case they do. I mean, um, so females are pink and the males are blue. Um, and then we look to see where do the diet items fall out and where are most of the, the otters. And you'll notice that there is a cluster of otters toward the center, um, the kind of the lower left center of that distribution. There's a lot of otters in there and there's otters spread out everywhere else. Um, here's where the diet items fall out. Um, and so they are, uh, what we did is we estimated the, the uh, isotope values for muscles, which are over on the left-hand side, that little gray oval represents the location of where muscles would occur if you were also analyzing their, their tissue. Uh, that big circle up above, that's carp, catfish, and other kind of uh, bottom feeders. Um, there's a, a kind of a horizontal oval um, below that, that's actually crayfish. And then right below that is another kind of horizontal oval. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer. That's the centrarchidae. And so that would be like the sport fish, like the bass and the sunfish and that type of thing. So they're over here. And then down below are saprinidae. And so those are a lot of the, the minnows and the other um, kind of more uh, forage fish. So um, so that's kind of a range of different diet items and you can see where they're distributed. So otters that fall close to one of those polygons is an otter that's consuming a lot of that particular diet item. So you'll see like um, up here above, you have otters well within that circle of the carp and the catfish. So they were eating those. You have quite a few that are in the crayfish oval some within that centrarchidae, that's the one where they would potentially be impacting, uh, conflicting with, with fisher, fishermen. And then um, you have mussels over here. You'll have a whole, but we have most of our otters in, in between, which means that they're eating portions of, of each of those. There's also potential diet items, important diet items that we don't have represented here. So, um, so there is that as well. But 
we clearly are seeing that most of the otters are not actually focused or specializing on sport fish. They're they're actually either um, eating a, an eclectic variety of diet items or they're focusing on something else that we haven't measured. So that's what the diet kind of looks like um, for the, the otters. Um, let me see. So just to illustrate the difference. So the, the other thing I want to point out is that these otters are, I mean, basically they're not specializing on much of anything they're, in terms of a population. You may have an individual that may specialize temporarily, but as the population um, in Ohio, they're being very opportunistic and they actually probably have a very wide dietary niche because of this huge spread. It helps if I compare that to like another species where we did a similar type of work. So this is another stable isotope map. This is for coyotes in Nova Scotia where I did work up there where there's very few diet items available to the coyotes up there. So coyotes would also typically be very opportunistic, but this was on an island that had very limited food items and um, these gray dots represent individual coyotes and you can see that most of them are clustered by far down in this one little spot down here over by moose and snowshoe hare these two open di uh, um, diamonds and then you have small mammals deer basically only one animal consumed any element of deer because deer were very rare and then you have uh, human foods over here and there were a couple of coyotes that were eating some human foods but most were clear down here. And so that's an example of a population that was actually specializing or focused on a specific diet item as opposed to a widespread, which is what you're seeing with, with the river otters. The other thing to note though, is that um, even with our very small number of, of diet items here, if we draw a polygon around them, we actually enclose most of the coyotes or most of the coyotes are very close to the edge of that polygon, meaning that uh, we probably did uh, sample most of the diet items that these animals are consuming. If we do that same thing with this otter population for Ohio, this is that polygon that we would draw around our diet items. We can see that there are a lot of, of um, otters outside of that polygon, meaning that we we don't have all of their diet items represented in this uh, in this diagram, which um, is perfectly, um, uh, I guess, understandable. So, for example, we don't have amphibians in this. Um, so that's probably a really important diet item uh, that's not represented. So just a caveat there. Um, we did find that there was some strong geographic differences in uh, the population in terms of what they were focused or what their diet was mainly comprised of. So if we if we do look at those um, primary um, five items, um, if we go over to the Northeast, these um, values that are in that mean category, though, that's the percentage of the proportion of their diet that was represented by that group. So for example, uh, for the northeastern population, mussels and that saprinidae, those were the primary diet items for those, those otters. If we go over to the southeast, it's the saprinidae that makes up almost um, two-thirds of their diet. Um, and then if we go over to the west, it's that actual, the centropidae. Um, but I would say that the western sample is the smallest sample of animals that we have. So, but um, it just illustrates that there is a lot of variation going on across Ohio, and it probably represents uh, uh, what's available to the animals in each one of the watersheds. So that's kind of what we learned in terms of the Ohio population. I just really want to go real quick over to back over to Chicago. I want to show you a few images of the animals that we were able to um, actually follow. Um, and learn a little bit from them. This is one of our animals that's about to be released. Um, again, because their necks are the same size of their heads, we can't, and because they need to be able to move through the water, 
We don't put radio collars on these animals. We don't put any kind of tags or anything on them. We have to uh, insert the, the transmitter in their abdomen, which is a, a perfectly safe thing to do. We've had no mortalities because of that. And it's a, it's been done for 40 years, but it does allow us to follow them. And it's a, it's been eye-opening. Um, one of the things that we learned right away was that their survival rate is quite high. And in fact, all of the studies that use uh, telemetry have found that um, this, the annual survival rate of otters is anywhere from 80 to 100% if you don't have trapping going on in, the, in that area. So conceivably, there's, there's um, the, the main threats to them would be automobiles, especially in the Chicago area, um, but also um, trapping and then uh, dogs and some other terrestrial uh, predators. But predators aren't really an issue for, for otters. Um, this is a map of the Chicago area, the, the large Chicago metro area. So we're going all the way from, from almost um, Lake County, that's the last county before Wisconsin, all the way down to Indiana. And these little dots, these little colored dots represent the radio locations of our otters. And I just want to illustrate two main things. If we look all the way down at the bottom, we see the white dots. That's our first adult male. He had an, in, an incredible movement range going along a canal um, that extended about 15 miles back and forth. Um, so it was long and linear, and so he had a very extensive movement pattern. Uh, there was also another um, male in the green that also had kind of a linear one, but wasn't quite as long as that. If you look all the way up to the north, that's where we had resident females. They had smaller ranges and they were using ponds or lakes and uh, they didn't have the long linear measurements or movement patterns. And they would actually move and rotate from lake to lake or pond to pond, even moving over land through neighborhoods to get to another pond. And we don't know for sure what was going on, but we believe that they were focusing on particular diet items. And when they would um, reduce the number in, a, in one body, then they would move over to another one and to another one just rotate around that way. Um, the photographer, and these are some of our radio tagged animals. So this is one of the females actually eating a fish. Um, so again, um, the, the otters are fairly visible. Um, in terms of activity patterns, um, for both these otters, as well as uh, we know for otters in Ohio, where we've also had cameras set up, um, they're active day and night. They tend to be a bit more active at night than during the day, but they can be, they can be active at any hour. And, um, and again, they, they're not afraid of uh, being um, photographed at all. Um, so this is otter three, otter three eating a frog. Um, in uh, 2017, this was um, um, an otter actually eating a, a catfish. It pulled catfish out onto the ice. Um, you can see the mouth of the catfish right here. And um, I mentioned they were social. So we, we get pictures of animals, um, multiple animals. This is the largest group. So this will be a group of five that the uh, photographer got. This is early, early in the morning, right at dawn. So it's, and it was from quite a distance away. So that's why it's kind of fuzzy, but you don't often see, you know, five otters traveling together. And um, this is an image again, taken from um, um, Jeff Nelson, who's the photographer. Uh, the reason why I focus on this one is that um, this was taken during, um, a, a huge Arctic front. Um, so it was only about five degrees out. Um, and that's ice and snow. That's the only open water part. And even in that extreme environment, because they're living in the water, it's not as extreme and they're active. So they're active year round. They're active in the, in the again, the most extreme type of weather an otter is still going to be um, out and about doing their business. Now, I will say one of the things that we learned from the telemetry was that um, in some cases, ponds or lakes will completely freeze over and there will be no open, open water. 
we all we always thought well the otters are not using that anymore they have to go somewhere else uh what we know now is that they don't they can they can live they can use a lake or a pond even though it's completely frozen over because their dens um are in the ground uh with the uh, aquatic entrance and so they can go in and out and um and and breathe and, and be just fine and still be able to do their thing under the ice without ever coming up and so in one of the cases for example we had snow cover for about three weeks we checked that uh the the banks of that pond off uh every single week we never saw otter tracks and yet the radio signals were coming from there and sure enough they were active that uh, you would not have known it because there was no sign above the ice. Some of the quick uh, pictures from the um, uh, uh, remote cameras that we're using that Lauren was setting up. So again, otters are not shy of cameras whatsoever. So here we have three otters uh, during the day, then another three otters at night. Um, three otters about to go into the, the water. These are not the same three otters. This, these are different years and different locations. Um, they're not always together in groups. In fact, most pictures are of solitary otters, but they will occur in groups. We do have a few instances of interspecies interactions. And so one of the, the most fascinating was that for about 20 minutes, uh, one otter interacted with um, at least two coyotes, and um, we thought perhaps the, the coyotes were attacking the otter, but it became apparent from the pictures over the time that they were just simply playing, or or probably more often, uh, I mean, more likely it's the coyotes were curious about the otter, and the otter just plays with anything. So this is the otter with the coyote in the background. Here's the otter looking at the camera with two coyote, the two coyotes behind him. Um, coyotes are following him around, and then he will actually at some points follow them. Um, and they would do this. Here's the otter over on the left hand side, and then the coyote interacting with each other. Um, and all of the the years we've been uh, radio tracking these otters since 2017, uh, we've never had a predation. I mean, we've never had an otter die from a predator event. Um, so, uh, in fact, we only had one death, and that was from a car. And so that is what I have for you guys. And so um, I'm happy to answer any questions in the time that we have left, if there are any. Let's see how we're gonna yes, start. thanks, Stan. That was, as always, fascinating. Loved all the pictures at the end as well. And we do have some questions. And folks, if you have questions, just um, you can keep on putting them in the Q&A box. And we're just going to start at the beginning here. Um, so Carolyn is asking, do raccoons have similar latrines? Mm. So great question, Carolyn. And uh, raccoons definitely latrine, um, but it's different. So um, so the, the otters are actually creating their mound and a kind of a making their platform and then pooping on the platform. And we do think there's maybe more than one otter defecating, but that hasn't actually been well demonstrated. Uh, it's a little unclear in terms of what's going on there. For raccoons, they latrine, but they uh, use existing structures. So they especially like to latrine, as you probably know, on logs. So anytime you're sitting down on a log, be careful because there's often a raccoon poop right there and you don't want to get that on you uh, that's bad um, and we do know we actually did a lot of research on raccoons and actually looked at their latrines and we actually measured how many are documented like there were definitely multiple raccoons using latrines and in fact we even tried to create our own artificial latrines of raccoons to see if we could attract raccoons to those sites and um uh, we failed if we tried to make our own poop, and I'm not saying we used human poop, but we tried to make our other stuff, but, uh, but if we used actual raccoon poop from the local area and placed it on certain logs, we could get raccoons coming and defecating on top of it. So, um, so in that way, in terms of communication, I think it is probably very similar because raccoons are not territorial either. 
So we don't really understand what they're doing. Some people have suggested, it, it turns out that if you ever look at like where raccoons defecate, a lot of times they're in the crotch of a tree or they're on that log. A lot of people, this doesn't come from me, this comes from another old time biologist, but they suggested that the raccoons are just kind of picking out an overview, looking at their environment and the urge just comes. <laughs> and so the urge just comes kind of like when you're, I don't know, like in a library or something. Um, so they're, but they're just looking at their environment. Um, so that could be what's going on, but the otter is different that, that they're actually creating that thing. So there, there's something about that spot that makes them want to mark it. So don't beaver do something similar by making scent mounds and then kind of spreading their glands over it, but they actually mound up the dirt as well? They do. Um, it's a little different. Yeah. So there's actually, um, so it's a little different with beaver in that they are territorial. Um, so they're, it's a little bit more easier to understand like what they're accomplishing there. And they're also have these really tight knit family groups. Yeah. Um, so, but there's a lot of similarities between river otters and beaver and both in terms of their lifestyle, but also that may be a lifestyle type thing. That's what they do because mm -hmm. maybe because they spend all their time in water foraging and hunting and things like that, it's not as easy for them to mark. Like a, a coyote that's, or a raccoon that's doing their normal thing, they always have opportunities to mark. But when you're aquatic, you have to actually come out on land. And so maybe that's an, one reason why they're doing that. Um, but there, there's a, also, and I, I didn't mention, I mean, there's a really close uh, relationship between beaver and river otters. So river otters benefit from beaver um, because actually, uh, we believe that river otters probably slightly prefer more stationary water as opposed to moving water. Um, moving water is a lot more dynamic when you have floods and that type of thing, uh, when you have rain. But the stationary water tends to be a bit more absorbent. Um, and of course, beavers produce the habitat that creates that um, preferred you know, water. So um, where, where you have beaver, you often have river otter. Uh, so Carolyn's also asking, um, how are otters traps? Maybe kind of a description about, you mentioned foothold traps, but maybe a little bit more detail on that. Um, so they're usually traps, yeah, with footholds. So um, they're the steel jawed traps that are um, used for land animals as well. So um, coyotes and, um, you know, raccoons and other animals, foxes are trapped with the jawed traps. Otters are as well. It's just that you place the jaw trap under the just under shallow water where they just are coming out of the water, and then they're uh, pinned. There's there's a chain that um, keeps them from being able to go back into deep water and getting themselves in trouble, so that they're able to to stay out of the water. Um, so that's one method. The other method that that. Um, are used mainly by us or some nuisance trappers would be um, large, what we call Comstock traps that are just great big box traps. Um, and the box trap in this case, in, in some cases they're placed on land uh, or in really, really shallow water. So like um, a really flat part of um, an edge of a pond or um, they're, they can also have floats on them. And so they can float out on the water but they're above water, so the animal doesn't drown, and they're live traps. So that's often what we use for our animals. It's been about 50-50. Thanks. Uh, Theodore is asking, uh, do we know how accurate those trapping reports are, um, you know, from folks that are trapping? And yeah. Um, I don't know. I, um, you know, I'm sure... Um, I, I'm sure that there's probably a few, a little bit of fudging that goes on a little bit, but I actually think that a lot of the trappers, I mean, I've talked to a lot of them and, um, I think that a lot of them are doing, I mean, I think they're being pretty responsible with their reporting. Most of them, there, there's always going to be a few cheaters out there, but, um, most of them aren't, you know, I, I would, I will say 
that um, one of the groups that was most in favor of reintroduction and actually not harvesting um, the animals when they were reintroduced was the Ohio Trappers Association. So they were they were not in a rush to start trapping otters at all. And in fact, they were concerned and they were they were very they wanted this monitoring that we were doing to determine like what what's appropriate because they didn't want to lose otters either. So that's that's from the group perspective, but there's always going to be individuals that you know may not always report reliably. Okay. Carol is um, asking about unintentional bycatch. For example, you're trying to trap a muskrat and then you accidentally kill an otter, you know, unintentionally. So would that contribute to them being underreported? Mm, really good question. Yeah. Um, so there is bycatch with people that are, it's beaver trapping that tends to catch otters, not so much muskrats, uh, otters, muskrats, it can happen with muskrats, but it's a smaller trap and um, otters may be able to pull out of those, but beaver trapping is different. And uh, that you can get bycatch from beaver trapping for sure. Um, and so there were, even in the years before har there was a restricted harvest, uh, there were some otters being taken in, in an unintentionally um, by trappers in their beaver traps. Um, so they did, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were a number of them that didn't report it, but some did. And in fact, some of the carcasses that we use for the um, diet stuff came from bycatch. They were not animals that were supposed to be caught um, by, by beaver trappers. So that that can happen for sure. Um, Julie's asking, why don't river otters live long? Uh, man, so that's a good question because their survival rates are so high. Yeah. You should have a lot of them, um, older, but, um, I don't, I think, um, they, so one of the things that we perhaps underestimate is the influence of disease for these guys to some degree. Um, we do know that they get certain parasites that can be pretty um, impressive um, in terms of what they can do to the animal. And then they are susceptible to things such as uh, canine distemper. And we tend to underestimate that because it's hard to document. Um, even for animals that, let's say we have radially implanted, um, if they die in the water, um, even though we have sensors that are supposed to tell us when an animal dies, um, they can disappear because signals don't re, um, are not very um, receptive. We can't we can't get signals very easily when they're down in an aquatic environment. So that can be underestimated. Um, but uh, it's probably um, a product again, a product of a growing population still. So there's still almost half of the state, which is um, still um, and probably not anywhere close to completely full to capacity um, with river otters. So you're going to have younger animals that are more represented in the population. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, um, I and I should have mentioned this, is that age distribution is based on animals that were trapped and killed. And there's probably a bias in that sampling and that the animals that are most likely to be trapped and killed are younger animals. Um, and so those older animals are wise and smart and may not show up in the population or in that population estimate as much. So, but that's a great point. Makes a lot of sense. Great. Okay. Uh, comment from Yvette on what an amazing story and thank you so much. And then we have a couple of questions. Um, Isabella and Theodora are both kind of asking, what are the ecological benefits that otters provide? Um, well, so I'm always going to be biased because, um, you know, I tend to study the predators. And so um, they are an apex predator of aquatic systems. That means by apex, meaning they're the top predator that 
doesn't really have to worry too much about predation on themselves. Um, they're doing all, it's all top down predation from them. And uh, they probably help structure communities uh, in these aquatic systems um, by removing um, animals that are, or species that are becoming highly abundant and maybe reducing their number, perhaps reducing some of the competition among different members of that community. Um, so it's predation as a general rule, as an ecological function is really important. And um, aquatic systems need that predation uh, function just as much as terrestrial um, systems do as well. So probably they're probably helping to balance the system through their predation. Um, Carolyn's asking, why were the first otters only released in Eastern Ohio? Another great question. Um, so the division did um, habitat suitability analyses based on studies done in some similar states like Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan. And um, they determined that those particular watersheds had the, the, the highest uh, proportion of suitable habitat for the otters at that time. And that's why they were selected. So for example, like up in the Northeast, um, Killbuck uh, Marsh, that area was one of the prime release spots. And if you see that area, if you visit it, you can understand like why that would be such a, a, a good location for them because it's a lot of stationary kind of water um, mixed up with some, you know, um, uh, terrestrial habitat um, in between so they can move around and, um, and they can do it easily over large areas. So it's like a ripe spot just waiting for otters. So a couple questions on again, how otters are interacting with other species and you touched on beavers for a little bit, but what about mink and muskrat? Mm. Yeah, so mink and muskrat. Um, so one kind of interaction, I don't know if this is what you're, so one of the ways that um, otters benefit from some of those species is that they will use their their dens for their own dens. Um, so in some cases, otters may dig their own den, but in a lot of cases, they're just simply excavating an existing den that was, was used by a mink, or um, they will use at times like muskrat houses, um, beaver lodges, they've been, they will use beaver dens as well. Um, so, so they do benefit from some other species that way. Um, but in terms of their interactions, they will, there is some level of predation of otters on, on muskrats, but it's not anywhere close to the level of what mink um, do with muskrat. Um, in terms of competition, between competitors, mainly mink and, and otters, that's actually an area of active research right now. So people are actually looking at that to determine if there is much competition there or not. Um, we have kind of been looking at that a little bit with um, all of the remote camera work that we've done. Uh, we were kind of comparing presence and absence of mink versus otters. Um, the early returns is that there wasn't any real clear pattern that, again, uh, certain kinds of habitat were appealing and used by both. Um, so, um, and we don't have any evidence that um, otters, so a lot of times when you have two different predatory species um, co-occurring, a lot of times the larger predator will impact and remove the smaller predator, it's intra-guild competition or intra-guild predation is what it's called. Um, it's an open question as to whether or not any of that's occurring for the aquatic predators, um, like we see for the, the terrestrial predators. So that's a, it's a, it's a great question and uh, one that a lot of people are interested in trying to answer. Um, Robert's asking, what is the smallest stream otters are likely to use? Uh, Robert, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that one. 
Um, so we'll we'll see. I mean, as the population grows, I would imagine that um, you're going to see otters, you know, kind of pushing their limits a little bit in terms of where they're likely to go. So they're they're more likely they may use smaller and smaller streams as their numbers get greater. Um, but I don't really know what the smallest size stream would be used by an otter. Yeah. Not really sure. Um, they would probably need to have, I would imagine it needs to be supplemented with uh, some ponds or some adjacent lakes, that type of thing. Usually, even the ones in large streams are leaving the streams and using something else temporarily and then coming back. Interesting. Somewhat related, um, there's a question about if trapping isn't that popular, or at least not very many individuals are being taken, and they aren't having issues with predation, and the population continues to grow, could there be an issue with overpopulation or needing to control that population? Yeah, I was. I guess I was maybe hinting at that a little bit. <laughs> so when I was at, in Missouri, that's exactly what happens was that the the numbers, I mean, the otters became too successful. The um, Missouri is known for having a lot of really important, um, biologically important river uh, watersheds. Um, certain winters or uh, rivers are not only scenic rivers, but they have important, um, um, like um, certain uh, prey items, some mussels in the streams that are state endangered or maybe even federally endangered, as well as the fisheries. And you had you had situations in Missouri and then nearby in Illinois where they also had a highly successful reintroduction program where you actually had some state or federally endangered species being impacted by the otters that they reintroduced. And that was that was definitely an issue, it caused a lot of problems. Missouri had an active aquaculture or has an ac active aqu aquaculture industry, and they were being impacted. I mean, again, you can imagine what happens when an otter gets into a, a completely clear, confined area with a lot of big fat fish. So they clean it out really fast. Um, and so they had to find incentives to actually harvest harvest the otters. Um, on the local level, they also had to do just some um, um, conflict removals. So uh, using those uh, Comstock traps I was talking about, that's a really common way to, if you have an otter that's depleting someone's pond where they just, I don't know, paid a lot of money to have it stocked or that type of thing, a lot of times they will live trap the animal and then relocate it somewhere else. And so they were also engaging in that um, for certain locations and certain companies and certain landowners. But it was, it, it definitely could become an issue. And that's why a lot of states want to know well, what's the appropriate time to start removing some individuals. The problem though, and the challenge is gonna be, uh, you're right, um, you can't necessarily use harvest anymore as a tool for reducing those numbers because again, it's dependent on uh, market and the market and social, you know, acceptance. And both of those are going down for, for trapping. So it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to watch over the years, you know, in Ohio, as well as these other states. Interesting. So a little bit of questions on, you know, different parts of Ohio where you may Sea River otter, and I know you said it's not uncommon to have them in most major river bodies, but a couple of folks are asking about specific areas. One would be the Maumee River in Northwest Ohio, and then along the Lake Erie shore. Um, Gary's wondering, you know, about Crane Creek. That seems like great habitat. It is great habitat, and I'm pretty sure there's definitely um, resident otters there. Um, so it's hard to know for sure because again, we're we're totally dependent on um, where, unfortunately, we're kind of dependent on where animals are, are trapped. And we don't have much trapping going on. And so it's hard to know. And I'm not saying that we need to trap more. I'm just saying that that's unfor it's unfortunate that our, our knowledge often only comes from that. 
Um, so we do have the bridge sign surveys and some other things that indicate presence, but they don't tell us much more than that. Um, and so the best thing to do is just, uh, to look for sign. And also, a lot of people don't realize you you probably have seen an otter if you're out a lot and you're if, if you're out um, near water bodies. A lot of people may see a, a V going across a, a pond or a lake, and uh, they may associate that with the, they may think it's a muskrat or a beaver or something, and it's actually a river otter. Um, you just didn't know it. So just, I would say, keep your eyes open, especially early in the morning and uh, early in the evening, and just watch the top of the water. And um, again, they're not shy um, at all. And so you will see them if they're there eventually. I, I, the, they're not shy kind of reminded me that there's a question on the a, a chat about, you know, somebody commenting, Beth is saying, otters seem very playful. Are they more playful than other animals? Is that playfulness an adaptive behavior? Uh, so, I mean, they are playful, 100%. So even when they're by themselves, <laughs> They still play like crazy. So we have a lot of pictures of otters. You know, you've probably heard about, I mean, that's another um, type of sign. If we ever do have snow, it's not that common much anymore. But when we do have snow during the winter, that would be a good time to go along some of the rivers and look for slides because that is when you're going to see slides. And otters love, love, love to slide in snow. Um, like and so we have just by luck, you know, I had a, a camera set up in a couple of different places that ended up being a river, a river otter slide. And we got pictures of them just sliding. Um, sometimes it was a group, sometimes it's just a otter by itself, just going up and down, just sliding, um, just doing nothing more than that. So they like to do that. Um, yeah, they're super playful. Um, we, the, the photographers picked up a lot of pictures of our otters just um, just doing stuff with their front feet. I mean, their front feet are highly dexterous. They remind me a lot of you know raccoons in a lot of ways, um, but they they're extremely sensitive. They have a really fine sense of touch in their front feet, and they use their feet um, for a lot of different things. And um, Often they're just they're just screwing around with things, just playing. Like raccoons. Like raccoons. Yeah. But they're more playful than raccoons. Raccoons only to a certain extent. Um, and then they're just the they don't like to raccoons don't exert that much energy if they don't have to. <laughs> uh, but otters exert a lot of energy and they seem to do it like they love to do it. Sounds like my eight-year-old. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Uh, James is asking a little bit more about fishers. Where exactly have they been spotted in Ohio? Um, where exactly? Well, he just said where. Where have they been spotted in Ohio? <laughs> um, so there's been a few sightings, confirmed sightings, and I believe they're, um, well, I'll just stop at sightings. So there's been a few sightings of confirmed sightings of, of Fisher just right along the uh, the far eastern counties along Pennsylvania there. So, on, and uh, one in the Northeast. So, um, yeah, so the, Pennsylvania has a growing Fisher population and it's only a matter of time that some of them would make it over into Ohio. Um, and so that's gonna be pretty exciting to see what happens there too, because Fisher, um or are like an otter only terrestrial and um not as playful they just like to kill things so um they they over in the far in, in the northeast in the urban areas there are urban fisher by the way and uh, when fisher actually moved into some of the cities they they don't like cats so they kill cats and they tear them into pieces and and people were blaming the coyotes for all the cats getting killed and it turned out that it was fisher and, and i mean coyotes aren't actually they don't take a lot of times they don't take any cats or they take very few cats um fisher kill every single cat they can find 
So, uh, uh, so it was bad PR for the coyote when the fishers moved in for a while until biologists figured out, oh, it's it's fishers that are doing that. So, um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens as fishers become more common in Ohio. All right, is it at all them coming back into Ohio at all related to the fact that porcupine are also coming back into mm. Ohio? Good question, because what Marnie's uh, probably alluding to is that the primary predator of porcupine uh, would be the fisher. The second most common would be mountain lion, but the fisher is the most effective predator on porcupine. And so um, it could be that there's a cause and effect. More likely, it's probably more coincidental, at least now, but it might it might make a difference in terms of how many fishers eventually take up residence. I mean, I would imagine the, um, I guess the carrying capacity for fisher would go up if you have porcupines move in uh, because it's a lot less energy for a fisher to take a porcupine than to live off of squirrels, which is what we think they're probably eating most of. Uh, but yeah, that's, a uh, really interesting relationship between porcupines and fisher. Um, it's the worst nightmare in the world for a porcupine to be at the top of a tree and see a fisher coming up uh, from the bottom because you got no place to go and that animal um, really knows how to kill you. Yep. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, getting back to otters, Chris has a question. How can otter populations be properly managed via harvesting when delayed gestation and varied mating times impact the offspring birth and success? Yeah, so that's one of the challenges for, for otters. Um, I mean, we so the delayed implantation um, does make it kind of fuzzy, but for the most part, so that's one of the things we were looking at, in addition to trying to model the population, is like we wanted to look at the females that are taken during January and February to see what stage of development of their pregnancy they were in, or if they had young out. Um, obviously, if they have young, that's bad. So you don't um, you don't want to be harvesting animals when young are being produced, um, if you want to harvest them at all. Um, so, uh, so that was one of the things we were looking at. Um, and we did get a mix. So we had a number, of, I mean, most females still have blastocysts um, during the time that they were being um, harvested. But we did have a few animals that actually had embryos um, so there is a, a fuzziness that goes on there, but for the most part, like we didn't have any animals that had recently given birth and were lactating. So I think the main thing is to try to keep the harvest season relatively short, but that is going to limit you in terms of uh, how much harvest you're going to have um, to a certain extent. Although I will say the whole the whole science of trying to manage these animals using harvest is complicated, not only by pelt prices, but also by weather and just the length of a season. Just extending the length of a season doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to have increased harvest because a lot of guys or trappers will start off the, the year, or start off the season energized and then quickly lose interest in that type of thing. So. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a challenge. I mean, luckily, um, I guess, if you want to look at it this way, the reproductive rate of otters is actually relatively low. So even though we've said that the population has increased and has done very well, um, it's not, um, I think it, it's going to take quite a while before we get to the point where otters actually become overabundant and become a problem if they ever do. So their litter sizes are limited because the female has to raise the young by herself. So they're not ever, I mean, they're very rarely getting to five young. Uh, most of the time they're three to four. Um, and we didn't have any examples of uh, young females in their first year becoming reproductive. So the biggest, one of the bigger age classes is not reproductive yet. And it's not actually, and then a small percentage of the yearling class was 
was reproductive. It's not until you get to the two-year-old and older age classes that they actually become almost 100% reproductive. So it takes a while for them to even sexually mature, to even be able to start having these relatively small litters. So all of that kind of combines to kind of produce a relatively slow population growth. Uh, so Diane's asking, even though otters have recovered in much of Ohio, why is it necessary to renew a harvest even if it is limited? Isn't there a concern that good habitat for otters is also at risk from humans? Hence the population's not nece necessarily safe from any future problems. Um, sure, that's a uh, that's definitely um, a concern that a lot of people have had. I mean, a lot of people didn't want to see a harvest initiated at all. Um, they just didn't see the point to it, and um, you know, you're not taking that many animals anyway, so why even bother do it at all? Um, so, you know, that's a that's a good question. It's just a different, I guess, difference in terms of perspective. Um, I mean, there is there are user groups out there in um, of, of different different people that, that get something from otters. Um, and so this is a limited way to allow those individuals to harvest. It also gave the division a way to actually, get important demographic information on otters. So there was a um, both a management perspective to it, uh, as well as, a, you know, addressing a sporting um, interest. But um, I think it's going to be, you know, the harvest is never going to be very large and it may go away. I mean, at, at some point, harvest um, trapping is a declining activity and um, it may kind of peter out on it on its own. Um, so, but again, it, there's, you have different parts of society that have different perspectives on that. And it's kind of a balancing act a little bit between them. Yeah. Uh, Eugene is asking, do river otters consume waterfowl? Yeah, so they do. Um, I don't know how often that happens, uh, but they definitely, um, yes. So it, it's a limited amount. So waterfowl do not make up a large part of their diet. Um, and it generally occurs during a very specific time. So it could be during the molt of the waterfowl when they're a little bit more vulnerable um, and when they're nesting. So that's when you tend to see a river otter taking a waterfowl. But when you uh, when you look at the, a lot of the really excellent waterfowl um, studies, especially nesting ecology studies, of which we actually were did one up in Manitoba, um, river otters are not um, an important predator on the waterfowl. It's it's definitely some of the other predators are much greater, but they will take them. And I mean, they're a weasel, and so if it's available, um, and if they can they can take it, they they will. So yes, occasionally, but it's a fairly minor food item. Um, I, I think you may have already addressed this when you were talking about your work in Missouri, but Mike's asking about freshwater mussels. That are str struggling to survive in our streams, um, do otters negatively affect those freshwater mussel populations that are struggling to recover? Right. No, good point. Yeah, I did kind of allude to that. So that that's a that actually happened in both Missouri and Illinois, where they had some uh, very rare species in protected areas, and then you had a reintroduct again another state endangered species, the river otter now brought in and recovering and taking those other state endangered species. So um, yeah, there were some, definitely some battles going on between biologists actually. Um, so the uh, the invertebrate biologists were not too happy with the fur bear biologists okay. about that whole thing. And um, they, they can pose a threat to them. And that's another reason why sometimes under certain circumstances, there may have to be some 
some management to limit their numbers because it doesn't take very many otters to actually have an impact on an area. Um, the positive side to that, though, is that because their their dietary niche, because they're so opportunistic, and they shift and they switch to different diet items, is that when one diet item becomes more rare and and less common, then they quickly shift to something else. They also physically move on to another area. So, you know, the pressure that they exert to an area, um, the, the, I guess the optimistic view is that it's temporary and that, um, and then they either move on to another diet item or they move to a different um, aquatic area. That's the optimistic view that, um, you know, they, they can definitely impact some of those threatened species. So somewhat related, Theodore is asking, is there any evidence that they could be a keystone species? Yeah, I mean, some the the quick answer to that is that <clears throat> some people would argue that ape, if you're an apex predator, you're a keystone species. Um, so, I mean, you're having an impact that trickles down, uh, down trophic layers. And that's kind of, that's one definition of a keystone species. Um, but whether or not that's been actually measured and documented for river otters, that's a different story. So um, we, we don't know, we haven't been able to do the fine scale measurements of, of the ecological impacts of these animals. Um, but that's, once people are able to do that, then that's, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what people are going to see is that they, you, you can definitely tell the difference uh, when an otter is present in a system and when an otter is absent. So um, that would tend to, to kind of fall into the definition of a keystone species. Um, don't know if it's on the same level of a beaver. Uh, beaver tend to have a bigger impact, but, but again, a lot of times, and um, what we've learned with the terrestrial predators, I mean, even like wolves in Yellowstone, it takes time to document what kind of impacts they're having at the ecological level to actually document their their impacts as a keystone species. So um, there hasn't been a lot yet to to um, verify that, but hopefully the research will be coming, you know, um, in the future. And I just won't be surprised if, yeah, that they show, they show, they do show some of the characteristics of a keystone species. So we're, we're working our way through these questions. I think we're getting towards the end. Thank you so much for staying with us, Dan, as you're probably noticing. It's a whole nother presentation with just the questions. Uh, so we have some other good ones. I'm going to skip down a little bit because there's one that I think is quite interesting. James is asking, is there or are there any citizen science projects for monitoring river otters in Ohio? Or at least um, good involved. question. Um, I, I don't know of any. We were doing a little bit of that in Chicago, um, but in, here in Ohio, I don't know because we finished our work. Um, all of the bridge sign surveys that the division incorporates or uses, that's all done by their biologists. But um, I would keep my eyes open for some opportunities for citizen science work because I I would imagine at some point they're probably going to try to incorporate uh, more public um, activities or public um, participation in some of the surveys that would help a lot with our understanding like i was just mentioning it's unfortunate that we don't know more about their distribution one way that would help is if there were more eyes uh, checking bridge bridge signs um doing bridge sign surveys are easy to do or just or reporting the presence of an otter when they see an otter um in terms of a reporting system so um but I don't know of any particular projects right now. And unfortunately, we're not, uh, we finished our work with otters for the time being right now. So I don't know of any, but it's a perfect species for that kind of stuff because you can actually, you know, the more people are looking for them, the more reports you're gonna get. And that's kind of what we found in Chicago. 
Daniel's asking regarding otter demise in Ohio by the late 19th century, was it mostly due to trapping or pollution or trapping then pollution? Yeah, so it's hard to, to separate some of that out because people were not really measuring that at that time, but it is probably a combination of um, uh, the habitat destruction. So Ohio, um, just there, the Ohio landscape was decimated by deforestation, which had to have impacted the aquatic systems quite a bit, as well as pollution. Um, and a lot of other things such as the, the mining in the Southeast, um, that's also still an, an issue probably in some instances. Um, so habitat quality definitely degraded at the same time that uh, the animals were depopulated for their fur. So it's hard to kind of separate those. I think they probably all contributed, but the first really hit on them was definitely once they were able to use steel traps. So beaver experienced the same thing. So beaver were extirpated from the state as well. Um, and so again, otters and beaver kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and related to the last question on citizen science efforts, Abby put a, a link in the chat box, and that's for the Division of Wildlife, and they encourage folks to kind of report any sightings that they see, so it's a really easy process. So you can always kind of participate in when it comes to viewing uh, wildlife species in the state. So thanks for, for mentioning that, Abby. Um, Mark is asking, other than, other than humans, do other species prey on otters? Other species. Um, so at least in terms of their range, um, well, first of all, there are other predators. Again, predation rate, and this has been consistent across studies, across different parts of their range, is like predation is really low, just in general. Um, but some of the predators that have been documented in the Southeast in particular are alligators. So alligators do take river otters occasionally, but river otters are really good at avoiding predators, at least in the water. They are really awkward on land. Um, and so again, um, there have been coyotes, or at least in the literature, have been uh, reported to take them. So that's again, not too surprising. And uh, definitely up in the North, uh, occasionally wolves will take them. Um, once again, when they're on land, but um, again, it's pretty rare. I mean, there's just not that, again, they're spending most of their time in the water and there's not much in the way of predators for them um, in that system. Harry's asking if river otters predate Asian carp in the Illinois and Chicago area. Uh, they do, they don't. Um, it would be nice if that if they made up most of their diet. Um, so I don't think that they're going to. I don't think that they're um, depredating carp to the level that they would have any kind of impact on the carp at all. So they're not really act, acting as a biological control, and um, we don't see carp in their diet that much. Um, again, there could be individual otters eating them somewhat, but uh, everyone was kind of hoping that that otters would would take a lot more carp than they are. Um, and as usual, you know, nature doesn't now always work out the way we would like it to. Kathleen's asking for a little bit more information on parasites and diseases other than canine distem distemper, um, specifically what parasites are common to them and are there any other common diseases? Um, so there is a, they have some mites that they carry sometimes and um, there can be like a, a nasal mite um, associated with them sometimes. Um, there's a, a, a new, well, I don't know if she's still new, but um, a professor that we have here in, in the wildlife the uh, department, um, Risa Pesapain, Dr. Pesapain, uh, did her um, doctoral and I think postdoctoral work on specifically otter parasites. 
so she's a specialist on on that particular thing and she focused especially on uh, nasal mites on otters uh, which had not really been appreciated much before in terms of what kind of impact they have that's that was mostly sea otters but occasionally river otters can also get a similar kind of thing we actually haven't seen that much in the way of um the mites or the intestinal parasites there's a few i mean every carnivore uh, will get the occasional roundworm and so they will get those but in general um it's not we haven't seen them to be too much of a problem but uh yeah distemper and then they are known occasionally it's rare but uh, to become infected with rabies and it's interesting when they're uh, when that's happened, because there are records, recent records of otters attacking people and uh, viciously attacking people. And it doesn't happen very often, definitely not so much here in the Midwest. For some reason, like Florida is known for some otters attacking people down there, but it's probably a um, spillover of a possibly raccoon rabies um, spilling over into otters and otters getting rabid. So there, you do have that happening every now and then. But um, a lot of the disease ecology for river otters is, again, that's kind of an open area for uh, for research. We, we don't know um, what kind of, uh, con, you know, uh, regulatory uh, factors that, that might be taking place there. Very interesting. Uh, okay, Abby is saying, I have heard people say, if you have an otter nearby, it can take out all the fish in your pond in one night. Would you say this is accurate? This seems to be the message I like to present to the public. Trapping has a place in the management practice of the otters. This is why we need to preserve the heritage. Yeah, so then that's the other side of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the, the social spectrum is that um, some people want to have that tool. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it all depends on how big your pond is, depends on how much structure is in your pond, um, how long it takes for it to determine how long it takes for that otter to, to hammer that pond. Um, so I... I often hear the same thing. Oh yeah, I had fish here yesterday and they're gone today because that stupid otter got in there. Um, I think it's probably an exaggeration a little bit, but um, there's no question there's been certain, there's times when otters have made a, um, a significant impact on the fish in certain farm ponds, especially some of the kind of what I would consider to be like ornamental ponds where there's no structure. Um, they're like um, aquariums and <laughs> nice clear water. And you have, again, big fat fish. They're probably getting fed by people or something. And yep. and the, the otters will take advantage of that if they get in there for sure. But whether they would clean it out overnight, that's probably exaggerating a little bit because uh, they, do, they, do, they do have to take time to eat them. Um, although they they can be um, they can be wasteful, I guess I'll put it that way. So they can eat part of a fish and leave the rest of it and go on mainly just because they just they like to go hunt. They they're energetic and they can only sit there and eat for so long and then they need to go take a swim. A couple more questions here. Um, some interesting questions about my, uh, microplastics. Have you found any evidence of microplastics in the otters that you've um, captured? And let's see, Theodore says microplastics are known to by accumulate, mm -hmm. um, including pathogenic ones. Yeah, that's a great comment. Thanks for bringing that up. So, and so they bioaccumulate otters are bioaccumulators <laughs> so they're actually um in states where they're more common i mean they've been used to help monitor um ecosystems for certain heavy metals as well as plastics now uh, because they will accumulate in otters so um 
that was one of the things we we were going to look at. So we were collecting some organs um, and some other samples to look at. Um, we wanted to, especially over in the eastern part of Ohio, especially maybe in the southeast, look at a variety of different things. But uh, we could never get the funding to do that. So um, and it was take their their organs that they, they were taking up a lot of freezer space. So we had to make the sad decision to not look at that. And um, there uh -huh. you can argue whether or not I mean we we couldn't get um, yeah we put in a request uh, that went beyond the scope of what the Division of Wildlife wanted to look at. Um, we went to the EPA and. Um, there, we weren't going to have enough of a sample size or anything to for them to kind of justify us looking at those things. So those were the reasons for not not funding it. So no, we didn't look at it, but that, that they're a great organism organism to actually try to measure what kind of that stuff, how how much of that stuff is in the aquatic environment. Yeah. Well, and that kind of leads into our our very last question from Abby, which is you know. Would more research in the biology of otters be beneficial? You know, what areas are we lacking when it comes to research? Yeah, so you guys have already asked those questions. Um, so I can't add any more to what you have already asked. So you just mentioned um, their, you know, in terms of their ability to be act as a bioindicator for the quality of, you know, streams or other aquatic areas. Um, so, for example, we're trying to make that case over in Chicago that they, you know, they're trying to restore a lot of areas um, in urban settings. Um, in the aquatic settings, which don't get the same amount of attention in some cases as the terrestrial ones, again, that apex predator is kind of like the ultimate indicator that you've kind of restored that system. And so trying to determine like where otters can occur, where they don't occur. Is it because they just haven't had the opportunity or is there things that are holding them back? So so there's still a lot of you know habitat otter type relationships to work out. Um, but then also just um, we're going to have some interesting management um, challenges for um, otters uh, in the near future or maybe not. I mean, so we'll have to see. One of the things that we could never figure out because the study didn't go on long enough it's like what's going to regulate otter populations? Do they even have like a density dependent um, response to their populations? You know, they're not territorial; they're kind of social. What what eventually stops otter population growth? Uh, we don't know. It's a complete mystery. Um, it's a lot of a lot of biological things, such as. Um, again, going back to the reproductive system, like what exactly is going on there? Uh, when does it happen? Um, and there are social relationships. So we don't understand what makes, are they just randomly social with each other? Or is it is it a kind of a family relationship or, or not? Um, there's a lot of mysteries about that right now for, for river otters. Well, that concludes the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Stan, for a wonderful presentation and for taking the time to answer all those questions. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and Kathy is